Argonne National Laboratories, Idaho Division, located at the National Reactor Testing Station, operates the experimental breeder Reactor 1. Experience gained since 1951 in the operation of this reactor forms the foundation for fast power reactor development. This is the first reactor to employ sodium potassium alloy as a coolant and to utilize the direct current electromagnetic pump. During this time, the reactor performed satisfactorily as a steady power source, demonstrated the breeding concept, generated the world's first electricity from nuclear power, and served its primary function in providing fundamental fast reactor information. When EBR1 was operated at power to flow ratios one and one half times the design ratio, some undesirable dynamic characteristics were observed. These were a prompt positive temperature coefficient and a tendency toward spontaneous oscillation of power. It was believed these characteristics were related and that the cause of the prompt positive temperature coefficient was either the Doppler effect, which increases the effective fissioning cross-section due to heating enriched uranium, or to mechanical motion of the fuel elements. Enriched uranium in the form of a helix was prepared for measurement of the Doppler effect in fast reactors. This experiment was performed in the laboratory's critical assembly facility, ZPR3. The helical form was adopted to minimize motion due to heating, which could produce undesirable side reactivity effects. Positioned within an assembled EBR1 core mock-up, the helix was periodically heated, then cooled on a 20-second cycle time. Careful measurement of the power oscillations resulting from the cycling made it fairly certain the Doppler effect was much too small to have been the primary cause of the prompt temperature coefficient observed in the reactor. Concluding that the primary problem was mechanical motion, it was decided to investigate EBR1 performance as part of an overall program to study reactor dynamics. A rigid core assembly to restrict mechanical motion was designed for EBR1. Designated Mark III, the core structure consisting of laminated steel disks was machined and assembled by the laboratory central shops. The inside hexagonal surface fits the outer perimeter of the blanket sub-assemblies. These disks are held and aligned with tie rods. Paralleling the assembly of the core structure, fabrication of Mark III fuel was underway by the metallurgy division. The fuel for the Mark III core is uranium enriched to 93%. The blanket is normal uranium. Both blanket and core uranium are alloyed with 2 weight percent zirconium. Clad with zircaloy II, they are co-extruded into the form of a rod. The rough cores for the blanket extrusion billets are produced by casting in a multi-cavity graphite mold. The enriched uranium is melted in a 5 kilogram batch and cast in a single cavity mold. A graphite crucible coated with ceramic wash is charged with the uranium biscuit and zirconium sponge for the blanket alloy. Melting and alloying is done by induction heating in a vacuum of 10 microns or less. After alloying, the metal is bottom poured into the mold by lifting a stopper rod. These castings, after machining, are tested for homogeneity by a non-destructive method. A sound transmission principle is utilized. Five megacycle ultrasonic waves are generated by means of a quartz transducer and sent through the metal. The quality of the casting is graphically recorded on a strip of electrosensitive paper. The casting, after further machining, yields two extrusion billet cores. These cores, assembled with copper nickel end plugs, are encased in a sleeve of zircaloy II. A copper jacket is added to prevent contamination of the billet components during heating and to provide lubrication during extrusion.
closed by heliarc welding, the assembled billet is then evacuated, outgassed, and sealed. The billets are co-extruded by nuclear metals incorporated to rods of one half inch diameter. Upon return, they are inspected, pickled to remove the copper, and swaged to a specified diameter. Heat treated for stabilization, the rods are cut to appropriate fuel and blanket lengths and the cladding thickness measured. To join the sections of either type rod, a commercial glass lathe was specifically adapted at Argonne for tungsten arc butt welding. This welding operation is extremely precise because of the difficulty of fusing the high melting zircaloy without excessive melting of the uranium. A 10 mil zirconium spacer disc separates the enriched and blanket sections on each fuel rod. Chill and gas retainers surround the electrode and weld area. Welding is purposely limited to the 20 mil zircaloy cladding and is made in a double pass, each pass requiring a different welding current. A section bond is made at each weld by fusing the metal in a small zone to add mechanical strength. The cladding is protected against oxidation by passing a stream of helium through the Vicor tube. After heat treatment, Cladding thickness is measured by an eddy current method. Eddy currents are induced in the zircaloy cladding by means of a point probe. The apparent impedance of the probe is influenced by the cladding thickness. The bond on the rods is then scanned by the ultrasonic transmission technique. Non-destructive testing methods help to ensure the quality of the completed fuel and blanket rods. Zirconium ribs are spot welded to rods ground to their finished diameter. These will provide accurate spacing of the tightly clustered rods in their final geometry. The welding operation is performed automatically on a specially designed condenser discharge type spot welder. Welds are placed at one quarter inch intervals along each of the three ribs, a total of 240 welds per rod. Machining operations complete the fuel and blanket rod fabrication. The completed core structure, ready for installation in the reactor tank, has a total height of 9 feet and 5 inches. The reduced diameter at the bottom will receive the core and inner blanket rods. The structure rests on this shoulder with the inlet plenum chamber located just above the upper blanket. This plenum chamber contains four two-way inlet valves for switching from series to parallel flow. The up position of the valves permits series flow through the inner blanket and core, while the down position allows parallel flow. The plate above the inlet plenum chamber has seal rings to prevent bypass leakage between the inlet and outlet plenum chambers. This seal plate also contains two flow control valves for throttling the exit flow from the inner blanket under parallel flow conditions. Under series flow conditions, these valves are closed. Additional rigidity is obtained by an arrangement of clamps around fuel and blanket subassemblies at the core center line and at the seal plate. The upper part of the structure is primarily shielding with an overflow plenum chamber near the top. The top plate holds the actuators and position indicators for the various valves and clamps in the structure.
The core structure is installed in the same reactor tank that housed the EBR1, Mark I, and Mark II cores. Fuel and blanket rods, with their attached extensions for handling, are positioned within a hexagonal can. Complete sub-assemblies within the hex can contain 36 rods and, depending upon location within the structure, will consist of fuel and or blanket material. A tightening rod is located at the center of each sub-assembly and, when expanded, provides additional rigidity. The thorough temperature instrumentation of Mark III includes thermocouples in the plenum chamber structure, fuel rods, blanket rods, and coolant passages. The complete Mark III loading contains 19 sub-assemblies. Seven enriched sub-assemblies comprise the core. These are surrounded by a ring of 12 inner blanket sub-assemblies. Criticality was achieved on November 11, 1957. It was determined to be 47 and 4 tenths kilograms of uranium-235, within 2% of the critical mass determined from the mock-up of the core on the Zero Power Reactor 3. Operating test data indicates that Mark III would be stable at several times design power, and the instability apparent in Mark II was due to mechanical design and is not inherent in fast reactors. This investigation of reactor dynamics is continuing and will establish parameters affecting the stability of fast reactors.